Welcome everyone and thank you guys for joining. My name is Shona Patel, Education Sales and Marketing Specialist for Australia and New Zealand. And I'm excited to kickstart our second Students to Industry virtual event, which is Sound Advice with Glenn Humphreys. Now just a reminder, these events are designed for you, uh, so the students, creators of the generation. So yeah, please feel free to give us your feedback uh, or some ideas from the future events. Throughout the webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask Glenn and Avid your questions via the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. So please be sure to ask your questions throughout the webinar and we will try and get to them at the end. Now on that note, I'm going to throw it over to our awesome host, Daniel Lovell. Um, yeah, over to you, Daniel. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Daniel. I, I manage the APAC pre-sales team uh, for AVID. And um, we're really lucky today to have uh, Glenn Humphreys joining us uh, from Deluxe. So uh, welcome, Glenn. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to be here. So um, what we are talking about today is really how at AVID we are passionate about empowering greater creators, but also we wanted to talk about how that's not just for the people in, this, in the industry now, but those that are going to be in the industry in, in the future. So that's uh, the, the main areas we'll be looking at, at today. And uh, so first off, uh, welcome to Glenn. And thank you to Glenn Deluxe and um, his uh, co-workers with him there in Australia to uh, take the time with us uh, and help with our interest. And I know your interest in education. Thank you, Daniel. So if thank you, you could, Oh, pleasure. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about what your title is, uh, what that entails, and, and maybe if you could, some of the examples that some people on the webinar might be familiar with of jobs that you've been working on. Absolutely. Um, my official title is I'm the head of audio services for APAC for Deluxe Entertainment Services. And underneath that, I'm also the sound CTO and the lead re-recording mixer for Deluxe Australia. What that entails is pretty much everything audio. Um, throughout my career, I've had sort of the titles added just as I've sort of advanced through. And I'm lucky enough now to be in what I consider to be my dream job because it entails, as I say, everything with audio. It could be um, recording dialogue, it could be mixing a TV commercial, or it could be helping someone bring together theatrical soundtrack, um, and also QCing, and also managing the deliverables for some of the world's biggest streaming platforms like Netflix, Amazon, and HBO Plus, and um, sorry, Disney Plus and HBO Max. Yeah, that. It sounds awesome. Now, today you're joining us from um, stage one, and I think, uh, Drew, you might have some pictures of the room. We can see some of uh, where you are uh, from the camera view, Glenn, but I think uh, Drew might have some other uh, photos of the room that you're in. Hello, Drew. <laughs> oh, hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes sir. Ah, fantastic. Okay, yeah, we'll just go over to the preview. There's a lovely photo of uh, stage one. So that is in our most recent incarnation, and that was getting ready for a co-production job that we did with a sound company who's a production partner of ours in Queensland called Folklore. So we were just getting set up for a final print master mix that, uh, that they'd brought down. Awesome. So, I mean, I think it's really, uh, there's another nice photo looking at a, at a different angle back into the studio, seeing the speakers around the walls there. Mm -hmm. For people who haven't seen a mixed stage before, the idea behind a re-recording stage or a dub stage or a mixed stage is that you're in the theatrical environment. So for people who haven't seen one, consider it as a normal theatre that you'd go to, like a vent or, you know, village or any of those type of theatres with only a couple of seats and a big mix console in the center and then supporting uh, workstations around that that all feed the different parts of a film soundtrack together so that it could be mixed together and then what we refer to as print mastered which is the final stage of putting together a theatrical soundtrack and that's what goes along with the um <laughs> great photo. Uh, that's what goes <laughs> along um with the finalized pictures um to the cinema and then when 
it's had its run at the cinema, it then comes back, and then you create a near field mix um, in a in a sound suite, in still in surround, but the soundtrack is then customized for the home theater environment. And I'm kind of lucky in that sort of space because my job leads into my hobby, which is home theater. So right. um, I, I, I love the whole process and I enjoy seeing the start and I enjoy seeing the end and the impact it can really make. Yeah, I, I think that's something we've, we've touched on before. But going back to something earlier that you said, like you really feel like this is your, your dream job and perhaps it's the dream job for many of the people that are listening uh, on, on, or watching on the webinar today. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how you found your way into the industry because it might seem a little inaccessible to some people. It did. It, it it does, and it did for me at at the very beginning. It took a it took a couple of shots. There were a few sort of missed opportunities and misfires um, earlier on. Um, I found it really difficult to break into the industry. Um, I started in music. That was my my passion. I've got a degree in music, and I wanted to create you know music. And then I discovered music for film and television, and then that led me eventually into post. Um, that journey took a very long time. Um, it, I, when I was finding it difficult to break into the industry, I was at a house party in Canberra and was with a very well-renowned film composer, Antonio Gambale. And I said to him, you know, how did, how did you find your way? And he said, look, if you really want to mix and if you really want to enter the industry, you need to, you know, get to know Pro Tools and you need to, to get with uh, a guy by the name of Chris McKeith, who was my mentor, my teacher, and has now become a, a very dear friend. Um, and I, I sought that out. I, I started at Pro Tools 101. I was knowledgeable and, you know, did everything in Logic for music. Uh, so the, the old eMagic program, which is now owned by Apple. Um, and... Once I was introduced to Pro Tools, that really opened up everything to me. So I started with 101, and then after I completed 101, I, I realized this is what I wanted to do because I saw the power of there's music in a soundtrack, but then there's dialogue, there's atmospheres, there's foley, there's all of those elements. It's it's such a... It's not, you know, there's no better or worse. It's just I enjoyed the culmination of all of those those elements to create a soundtrack. Um, and I applied for afters and I got rejected and that happened three times. And on the fourth time I was lucky and I got in and I did the, uh, the sound post course at afters. And at the same time, I continued through my AVID education. Um, once I'd seen the way AVID education was structured for Pro Tools and also for Media Composer, um, that was something that really drew me to it. It was the structured way that it takes you from in 101, I didn't, the first night I went to the, the 101 course, I didn't know how to open Pro Tools, I didn't know how to create a session. And by the end of that week of 101, I was confident I could open a session, I could create tracks, I could understand the busing. And it it really excited me to what the possibilities could be. And that's why I continued on and went all the way through and... Um, I went through to 310i for Icon, which is the console I'm on now. I actually did my exam on this console, um, uh, 310p, which is the the expert post, and then I branched out later on in my career, you know, recently into Media Composer and also the Avid Storage for for Nexus. Mm. Uh, so we've talked about it before. Also, um, I started my career. Um, although I live in Japan now, I was uh, involved in television posts in New Zealand for a, a, a long time before I came to Japan. And um, it was a similar thing for me, starting out uh, in education and uh, quickly finding that although I'd originally looked at some music uh, side of things, recording music, more studio-based recording, when those opportunities came up to combine those skills of uh, rhythm, sound, and pictures, it, it, for me, it really, it really struck something and helped secure what I, my future path. When I found those things existed, it was really obvious uh, what the end goal was um, at that point. And I think one of the things you said as well as for you, it was a, 
it was a combination of passions and i think we've talked about before but yeah when you see the people in the courses it, it is doing the courses but it's taking all the opportunities the networking uh talking to people who are in, in the industry that that's that's right and it's only through um those opportunities but you have to create those opportunities like you did you know we've spoken about this many times if if everyone watching daniel and um, drew and i go way back and you know we've we've talked about the industry and pro tools are a long time so we know each other really really well and there's so many similarities in our our career paths but we've spoken about it before is that you have to create those opportunities yes you can attend and do the course and my long-suffering wife um it, i was at afters from seven in the morning till 11 at night and i did that five or six days a week the course didn't require that but having access to that equipment and having the opportunity to learn more, you get in, you, you get out of it what you put in. And I think we've all had that experience. Um, one opportunity I've, I've mentioned to you before was when AFTERS received their first uh, Euphonics console, which is uh, a brand that's now been absorbed by Avid and that's the was the genesis of Yukon, um, which we all use now on the S6 and the S1 and uh, even the artist series kit uh yukon was was euphonics they received this brand new uh system 5 fusion console and you know it was at that point in time that chris said you know do you want to give me a hand putting it together and that opportunity wouldn't have come up if i hadn't have sort of shown that enthusiasm and shown that drive and passion um to be involved because it, it was late on a friday night and they were going to put it together on a saturday morning and i was there without question there was no way i was going to miss out on that and it's yeah. those kind of things, it's those opportunities that come up by being present and being active. That was the way I found the opportunities for me uh, came up. So uh, talking about education, I know that you've um, continually updated your education and made sure that you're up to date as best as uh, you can be with your busy schedule, I'm sure, <laughs> um, on the latest versions of, of, of Pro Tools. But also um, education and people taking education serves you in a different way. I, I know you, you use that um, when you're looking at potential people coming into your business. Absolutely. Um, from my experience with both university education, sound education and avid education, um, we look for people, or I look for people, who at least have Pro Tools 101 because what that tells me is I know what that person knows as a baseline. Anything above that is, is a bonus. And what that is, is because Pro Tools has become, you know, the industry standard, um, I know that with that 101 certification, that person can do X amount of tasks because they've been certified. Then that steps to 110 and there's that additional knowledge that they know. I can teach to people what we do internally easily. It's that baseline education that takes such a long time. And if you have that baseline in Pro Tools and that operational knowledge, it's easy to build on that. If you're having to teach someone who's come out of, you know, say uh, Logic or uh, Premiere or, or, you know, any of those other audio programs, they're all great and they do really good things in their own realm. But when it comes to what we do, we need that interoperability of Pro Tools. And that helps me sort out who is a potential hire and who isn't. And um, that that's the benchmark for me. Yeah, it was interesting. I think for, for both of us, we a lot of education courses um, in the beginning, they, they concentrate around around music and music recording. And, you know, I, I thought originally I would potentially be in a studio with musicians and um, be mixing those bands and playing music myself. Um, that was a direction I saw. But um, at some stage during our course, um, we were delivered a, a QuickTime file with no audio. And yeah. we were given two different challenges, actually. One was to write the music and make the sound effects only using analog synths. And oh, one wow. was to um, to do try and do some some ADR um, to, to replace the dialogue um, on those as well. And for me, that really opened up a whole different world 
uh, that was available to me. And I think, as we have talked about before, the really best mixes for post usually have a, a musical background to really help that feel and emotion when they mix. So even though it's post, I think there's a lot of musicality to it. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. There's there's so many great mixers who have, you know, mixers and editors and, and sound people who have a really rich background in music, whether they're musicians or they're passionate about music. And this is something we've, we've spoken about before, is that it's by having that sense of timing, emotion and rhythm that can really take a good scene in a show or a, a film and make it a great scene and make it emotionally powerful. And, you know, we've, we've spoken before about this is, is even with something as simple as a radio commercial, you've got a set 30 seconds of music. And if you've got a great voiceover artist and you're going through and you're deep breathing that a tiny move left and right, you know, forward and back on the, on the timeline can make all the difference in the delivery of a message or the delivery of an emotion and i think that that's the best sort of easy example to give and it's something that people can try you know at home on their own it's just see you know read something from a you know a tv ad you've heard and put some music behind it and see the impact of moving a word you know nudging a word by a frame or in slip mode just moving it by a tiny amount can really have an impact and that's i think you know, great mixes all have that sense of timing and rhythm. And I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I, I had a I had a great experience. Um, gosh, it must have been three or four years ago um, now. Although I'm at Abbott, I, I still do sound design and um, mix mostly uh, television commercials. But I had an opportunity to work on a, a longer piece. Um, and it was about... Um, actually, how when a child turns one, it's actually the mother's first uh, birthday as a mother right. and it was quite an emotional piece and we'd mixed it a number of times um, and we'd tried different music but we knew when we'd hit the right one because just the right balance you know uh, half a db here a half a db there actually made you feel emotional and i think that's the power that we have in front of us with these tools yeah they're interesting technology tools but it's really about telling a story that's, that's right. It's, it all comes down to storytelling. You know, all the tech in the world doesn't matter. What you have to do is get that message on the screen and get that emotion on the screen. And you're exactly right. A slight move in volume either way can can make or break a scene. And it's such a powerful thing to have, to have control of and, and to be involved with. Um, and also when you have a director or a, or a producer giving you notes, be that of now in this covid world where you're sending it securely and they're listening to it in their environment because you know people can't travel and that sort of thing it's that collaboration and interaction where you might not have thought that what you've done has made a difference but when it gets delivered to them and they they listen to it back if they get the feeling you're trying to convey it really is a, a great sense of accomplishment i find yeah, I, I, th I think so too. I, I, I was wondering, you know, the other thing we, we've had the, the pleasure of is meeting a lot of the other people in the industry. And I think one thing that struck me as I've had the, the great opportunity w to work with some really well-known mixers and uh, go to some amazing studios is that people are actually very kind, very accommodating, and, and generally just really nice people and i think there's an attitude component that also is quite important to finding your way in, into the industry absolutely attitude for me is everything um you know it doesn't matter how technically you know adept you are or how quick you are if you can't work with other people or if you know different you know things make you difficult to work with people won't want to work with you you know you're stuck in a big or a small dark room for hours on end um people only want to work with people who have a great attitude and are easy to get along with and will accept ideas and will accept direction and accept criticism you know that that was one of the hardest things i found when i was first starting out is that i was I was so nervous just to get the mix done and, and get it right and get it technically correct that when someone came back and said, oh, you know, bring the music up by X amount, 
it really, I was like, oh, you know, what? It took me a long time to to be able to to be able to take. It wasn't criticism. It was it was just feedback, and that was one thing I had to work on was that I was so blinkered by getting it technically right that I sort of shut everything else out. And and that's a a growth thing that I think everybody but it goes through but you're right some of the you know hollywood's best the world's best mixers and editors and sound professionals are just some of the nicest people in the world um i was really really lucky in 2015 to meet my hero steve maslow um, who mixed the first star wars film and we went out to lunch and he answered every question i had and I'm sure he's answered questions about Star Wars a thousand times, but you know, he answered my questions and you know was really still passionate about sound and is just the nicest guy in the world. And you find that with with everybody, um, you sort of come into contact with the people who sort of rise to the top of the profession are really nice people. They're giving people, and they're usually easy to get along with. Yeah, uh, that's certainly been been my experience uh, as well, and I think it's a good thing to remember. I, I, I've, it's interesting when you mentioned about the the feedback. Um, I, I know you learn quite quickly not to take um, comments and and suggestion and feedback on on your mixes um, personally. So, and it's always good to have more more feedback um, about things. So, I, I've often thought that. You know the job as a, a really good audio engineer or, or mixer is it's almost like you're translating the creative wishes to a technical process and you're the yes. person in between those two things so you know if you're asked for the sound of a rainbow it might be a bell tree for example but <laughs> you're, you're you're constantly translating between the the creative and the technical and so that That's communication cool. skill is is huge that, that, that's correct. And I've got clients now, I'm, I'm really lucky, I've got clients now that we've been working together for so long that when they send me a job, um, it's very rare to get notes or, you know, recommendations back from them just because that dialogue and that knowledge of what they're looking for has been built over, up over many, many years. And, and that's a great working relationship. You know, they're they're great jobs to do because you know what they want, you know you can deliver, and you know that you know you'll be able to deliver ahead of schedule because you know what they want. Yeah, no, it's always it's always been a great experience when you've done two or three episodes of a series, and instead of sitting with you all day long, they let you mix the next five and they check them back. And when you start building those relationships, it's a really satisfying thing as well. Exactly, and it just takes you know time, dedication, effort, and being able to sort of step back and, you know, detach yourself from your work and listen to the mix and go, yeah, is that conveying everything it should be? You know, if it's, if it's a 30 second TV commercial, do you get everything across and is everything clear? You know, you have to think about the environment that, that things are being listened to. And now that environment has never been broader. People are listening on you know, headphones that we're wearing now, ear pods, tiny iPads, massive, enormous, tele, you know, televisions, you, you know, theatres, you know, the whole thing of, uh, you know, sort of master once, deliver to many has never been truer, you know, because mm. people are consuming media on so many different platforms and in so many different ways. I. I totally agree. I just wanted to mention, we've got some great questions coming in. Um, keep mm -hmm. adding them. We'll get to them um, at the end. I see a couple have already been answered, uh, but there's some really great questions there and, and we'll definitely get to those in it at the end. Yeah, so please, um, please feel please. free. Any, anyone like, you know, whether it's an avid question or whether it's an industry question or whether it's a, you know, workflow question or kit question, whatever it is, we're, we're here to answer questions and we're happy to answer questions. Yep. So please send in whatever you've got. And there's no silly questions. Everyone's at a different part of their career. But I had to, last month, we we recently got an S1 and a doc. And there was about, I'll be embarrassed, about 20 emails backwards and forwards to Drew saying, okay, so what's the adapter you use to put it on a wired network to do? This? Because we're sort of um, very much restricted, because of the content we work on here mm. at Deluxe, 
is pre-release and is high security, um, we have ways that we have to do things. So setting up for today um, took a lot um, because, you know, broadcasting out to the world is not something that we do. We're very locked down. So, but that was something that I had to go back to Drew and say, hey, all right, I'm completely confused. What adapters do I need to make this into a wired network? And, you know, that's coming from me who yeah. should know all that stuff. But technology is moving at such a rate that just ask the question because someone else will have solved it at some point in time. So, you know, put your hand up, put it in the, the chat box or, you know, send it to Drew or whatever. But, you know, please yeah. feel free to ask any questions. Well, and it's always been something I think that I've been impressed with that there's a little bit of humility required if you don't know the answer to something it's really best to say look I don't know let's find out and that actually that adventure of finding out the answer yeah. teaches everyone so much um, so I've always really enjoyed that absolutely and and we've spoken about this before is is the accessibility to people and the accessibility of information I think I've, I've spoken to you before about you know, when I was a student and when I was first learning Pro Tools, I was desperate to get my hands on a template. I wanted to see how other people worked. I, you know, was what I was doing correct for a, a big TV show or for a film? Um, and that was something that I always chased. And now recently, um, I think it was Netflix. Yes, They've released yeah. a, 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 pack, a whole package to the public where you can download the Pro Tools session the objects and yeah. the web yeah that there's um adms there's uh, basically the entire deliverables are there and that's actually one of the questions that we have um you know it's difficult sometimes to acquire things and that's true there is a high level of sensitivity with the raw um, information mm. but actually uh, that netflix is a great example it's um, publicly available um, I'm not sure if uh, Drew maybe can find the link to it, but uh, you simply um, pop in your email and agree to the terms, which is basically it's it's yeah. for education, um, and that gives you an example of of really what's going on in the industry now, um, and uh, some pretty complex sessions, but but it teaches you what people are doing, and, and uh, as you mentioned, templates. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in Pro Tools we have sessions, but you can build a session that uh, we save as a template. So mm. you you open that up and all of your tracks and busing and everything's already organized as well as plugins and some audio if you want to as yeah. well. So that's that's what a template is also. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have I should have clarified that. But yeah, it's, a, it's the way that a Pro Tools session is laid out, you know, with audio tracks, auxiliaries, you know, how the busing is done and all that sort of thing. And what I found was that as, as a student, that information was hard to get to. But when I finally started working with people professionally in the industry and you sort of ask them, oh, you know, can I, can I have a look at your template? Yeah. They couldn't tell you enough about it. They'd be like, yeah, sure. So the dialogue's routed to here and then I bust it down here. And then you sort of ask, okay, why do you do that? Um, because it's not always clear, you know, sort of adding dialogue to music, to backgrounds, foley and effects. You know, there there are so many different processes that can go through, but um, having someone explain why they do something, that sort of workflow or that reason for laying that out has been developed over a long period of time because of things that they've found and you can learn from those people. And one person who was, you know, basically taught me how to mix was Greg Fitzgerald. Um, he's a fantastic Australian mixer, funny guy and you know, really nice person. And he showed me, you know, charts, mix charts of the way they used to mix. I believe it was for Happy Feet 1, the animation. Um, and although he didn't have the sessions, he showed me the mix charts and how they approached it back in a more analog um, time of, of how things were laid out and why they were laid out the way they were laid out. And that really opened my eyes. And so having that view to the past and you know, a view to the present in the way templates are laid out, especially now with Atmos. Um, that's been a big learning curve for us here at Deluxe. We haven't implemented an Atmos room yet. We're currently beta testing that with um, one of our ops, Christian. But that's the next step for us. But before we make that step, I want to make sure everybody's across it, understands it, so that when things go wrong, 
you can track back and work out why they went wrong and how you can correct them. And it's a really powerful thing to be able to do. So we're probably going to use, like everybody else, that Netflix template or that package as a learning tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's really great that those those tools are out there. Um, we all know in, in the industry as well. It can be be difficult to share things sometimes. So I think it's fantastic that there's um, companies and productions out there that are sharing that kind of information. Um, it, it's it's crucial because, as we say, we really want the the next generation to be prepared, and we're all passionate. Whether it's our own projects or someone else's, we want to hear great audio, interesting mixes, um, and, and enjoy it. Um, I've always found it interesting, like, you know, it's a good mix. I'm sure you feel the same. Like we've been in the industry for a long time and you can, you know, it's a good mix when you didn't think about it too much while you were watching the movie, I think is probably the thing. Um, if you're noticing too many things, it's probably not how you would have done it. I guess is the best way to say it. It's, it's subjective, but when you get to enjoy a movie, you think, oh, actually they did a really great job. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we're, we're really lucky here in that we get to hear so many different soundtracks. I mean, at, at Deluxe Weekly, you know, Deluxe Sydney Weekly, we work on hundreds of hours of content, you know, hundreds of hours in multiple languages and all sorts of things like that. But when we do get a large feature film in, um, when we have to deliver that, we have access to those stems. And being able to listen to those stems, stems are... The separated items, so we've been talking before about dialogue. Dialogue needs to sit on its own set of tracks, and then it's recorded to its own set of tracks, you know, as the the final. And stems contain everything sort of cleared out, so you can hear just the dialogue on its own, or just the effects, or just the foley, and foley for people who don't know is, you know, hand touches, clothing rustle, um, you know, if someone's fighting a battle their sword their armor things like that is is what foley is is referred to and then you've got effects on top of that and then backgrounds and you know i've i've seen templates where there's you know 24 tracks of wind you know mm. It, mm. it can really get down to that and those winds are considered backgrounds and they go into a background stem and some of these stems are you know, so well crafted. You could just listen to the backgrounds on their own with the film and it, you know, still be enjoyable. Um, yeah. You know, it was and, actually, and... that was um, one of the things someone asked me about one of my, uh, cause I sound design for commercials and it's usually on quite a, quite a tight um, time schedule. They always how are. I, how, how I go about it. And um, one of the things I would do is I would always start with the backgrounds and make the environment and feel like I was happy watching with just that. And yep. then I started adding the other things back in. So it's really interesting that you bring that up, that you felt like you can enjoy the scene with just any one of those stems. It's a really interesting point. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's only something I've had access to in, in the last couple of years is when, when you do get those packages. And, and it was a real, you know, revelation. You know, that's what makes up a good soundtrack. Then when you listen to it all together and you, you're right, you're not picking out one particular thing. It works as a whole. Um, and it's 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 really great. And it's interesting you say you start with the backgrounds on a commercial. And and see, so this is how you learn. I start with the narration. That's my anchor point. Um, you know, and then what I'll do is once the narration's done, I'll then look at the music and how complex that is and see where I have to then fill in backgrounds. So it's interesting. I might try that on my next yeah. project to start with the start with the backgrounds. The the one of the reasons I have is so often we're working against a just a rough music, something that's been chosen out of a music library while the actual music's being composed. Yep. And so the the way that that sits with all the backgrounds and stuff tends to change over time. Yeah. Um so that's one of the reasons I did it that way, but yeah, just right. interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um so uh, one of the other things I wanted to touch on and you're sitting on um you know one of our uh, consoles there is that um at throughout your career and certainly at deluxe there a lot of the equipment is based around avid uh, pro tools our, our control surfaces and also some of our other technology and um as well as not just why you have our gear but what is it that keeps you coming back keeping learning and keeping up to date with what we're doing i think it's a great question um even as recently as this year, I was asked to look at every possible 
audio program option. And I made a list of about 25 key things that they needed to do. And we spent a solid week going through each different program. And there was nothing that could do everything that we needed that we currently do now and that we will have to do in the future. Um, the reason why I keep coming back for training is that now that I've got that sort of base level, um, I think I sent to you guys the, the my cover of my 310p Yeah, uh, I think Drew can probably pop that up. Manual. And you will see that it's dog-eared and it's bent. It's because it's my Bible. It's I still refer to it to this day because you can't remember everything in Pro Tools. And Chris McKeith has got a great saying is that there's three ways to do everything in Pro Tools. And that's because it caters to all manner of sound professionals, you know, podcasters, dialogue recorders, music mixers. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's seen better days, that one. But, you know, that's Pro Tools 10. And it's still valid today. And that's the great thing about Pro Tools is that it every year it continually gets better. And it's not just version chasing with operating systems. It's adding features. And that's why I go back is to just get, you know, a solid handle on those new features every time they come around um, off that, that, you know, base level sort of knowledge. The other thing is, is that, you know, you mentioned your TV commercials are really, really, really tight turnaround. It's the same for us um, in every project that we do. And the only thing that creates or, or offers a full package is Avid from Pro Tools to Media Composer to the new Nexus storage platform, which can now be built into a cloud platform depending how you want to work. It's all designed to work together. And I think, you know, I always sort of say that the, the word workflow is bandied around too much, but what it gives you is a complete ecosystem of workflow. And that is the advantage, is being able to get that information from a media composer, handing it over to Pro Tools, mixing in Pro Tools, and then handing that temp mix back, you know, for the online or for the grade. And yes, feature films are sometimes graded in different things, but you're able to export that audio so it can be repurposed you know sort of downstream or upstream um at whatever point the project is in its life cycle before final delivery it was interesting that um you're touching on on those sessions being where things lived um it, it's interesting to me that um, often within production, it's actually the Pro Tools session that is the place where everything lives. It's yep. it's what gets moved around between studios. It's it's what you provide sometimes to um, streaming providers as well. And it's That's it's right. really it's not just just a a standard. Uh, although that again, that's a word that sometimes get used too much. But yep. it is actually the file type of the industry in many cases. It, it really is. And Netflix now have, so we have an internal file format and it's for a couple of different reasons. It's for transportation. So, or, you know, um, not physical transportation, but file transportation so that that mix gets from point A to point B without being altered. But also we all have the Pro Tools session as a final deliverable. And whether that's the print master that I was discussing before, where it's the completed mix end to end at the correct time code point or whether it's the stems or whether it's the dialogue stem and the print master the pro tool session is now sort of a, a standardized deliverable and it's something we create every day once a, a program is you know completed past qc and is ready to be mastered we send our internal you know sort of bespoke wrapped file but we also send along the pro tool session so that that can be sent to the client as their master deliverable and they're archivable so that it can be recalled in the future exactly i see lots of great questions coming in so i want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for that i know we're both pretty open as far as time yep. goes um but uh just switching gears a little bit um mm -hmm. I think it's pretty obvious to everyone that there's been some pretty massive changes in the world and the industry, certainly this year, but probably over the last five, six years, things have changed quite a bit um, that the traditional movies, the traditional TV shows 
have changed. There's a lot of new uh, providers. You know, you've mentioned Netflix um, several times. That that we are working and probably producing more high quality content than ever before. There has not been, I, I completely agree with you, there hasn't been a time in history where there's been more content created um, for the screen, ever. You know, there are, what the streaming platforms have allowed is programs to be commissioned that are really niche, and that's a great thing. You know, the, the one thing that happens with that is that because the streaming providers, it doesn't matter who it is, are global, those programs then need to be dubbed into multiple languages. And that takes what was an enormous amount of media and quadruples it because you now have, say, uh, what's a good example? What's new? I don't know what's new. I'm so, I'm so behind on everything. Let's say um, one thing for me, Breaking Bad. Great show. Loved it. I know it's eons old. But if you have a look on Netflix and you go to the audio menu, you will see that Breaking Bad is available in about nine different languages. And dubbing and foreign language work isn't what it used to be. I think we all remember the kids' cartoon Monkey where the lips yeah. moved and then a minute later the audio came out. Um, there are now very, very, very strict guidelines that dubbing has to adhere to. And it's down to four frames. And if you're working on a 25 frame per second you know, show, that's a very tight margin that you have to meet. And on top of that, you also have to duplicate the what was done in the host language. So Breaking Bad was done in English. Any of the communications, you know, cell phones, CB radios, car radios, they're referred to as being futzed. And what that means is by sort of degrading the signal um, to make it sound like it's coming out of that car radio or from that cell phone or from that CB radio. And all of those creative things that were done in the English language version have to be replicated identically in the foreign language version. You know, it has to be the same. And, you know, you, you're right. You know, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Disney, you know, all of these streaming platforms are coming on board. And I think one big sort of indicator of, of where the industry is moving to is what Disney did with Milan. The um, what was, I think it was it started as an animation. I'm yeah, terrible with this that, stuff. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it started as an animation, and that was going to be their big feature for this year. And because of COVID and because of what happened in the world, it had to then be moved to a streaming platform. And as I mentioned before, you can mix mm. in a theatrical room like this, but to make that mix work. For people at home, it has to be reversioned for near field speakers for a smaller listening environment so that you can hear the dialogue and you can hear everything as you would in the cinema, but in a much smaller sort of space. Um, and it, it really has grown exponentially. You know, there, there are hundreds of hours of content coming through us and our competitors and everybody else that need to be processed, checked platformed and delivered and it really has introduced another side to the industry yeah and i think you know going back a little bit we, we've tried at avid to be on top of that and and work with um you know these providers as well as the other technology providers things like atmos to make mm -hmm. sure we make it as as, as as simple as we can there is a lot of yep. work to do but we want to make sure it's as efficient as possible and um Two things I want to go back to that we we talked about the other day. Mm -hmm. um, one is just that um, idea of it being a standard. So you look at your dub stage and someone who's watching, like, oh, I know Pro Tools, but I'm not sure how I would go about doing things when I get to that room. And I think that the idea of it being standard is all the things you learn in your 101, the things that Pro Tools window that you open is still the same thing in, in, in the dubbing room. There's just more equipment, which you can explain, but the that, basis is essentially the same. That That's spot on. And, and, you know, I've sort of been lucky to be able to visit some of the world's best mixing stages. And prior to understanding Pro Tools, um, being in those environments were very intimidating. But when you walk into a room and you see Pro Tools, you know confidently that even though there might be some differences in the way equipment's set up or the way, the way you turn equipment on and off, if Pro Tools is there, you can actively be a participant and you can open a session and 
you can look at how things are routed and you understand it's just that there's more of it and so, you know once you know sort of you know the the basics it's just being more of it because you need to add more and that's the great thing about pro tools is i've taken sessions that i've built in this room on this session or on this this surface and on this computer taken at home and still been able to do active work on it at home because Pro Tools are scalable. Five years ago, you couldn't do that. And now yeah. with the advances in Pro Tools, you can take, you know, a 400 track session home and be able to work on it or be able to add to it or even listen back to back to parts and make notes for the next day. In, indeed. And the other thing I think is interesting and probably a lot of people don't get a look into this that you mentioned and um, had a few experiences myself, but around the degree of security that's required when you are working on, on some of these not yet released uh, movies and, and television shows. Um, I'm sure you'll have plenty of experiences to relate, but I know uh, visiting some studios in the States, you know, talking to the mixers there, having to install cameras, sometimes yep. even security guards, things yep. like uh, safes to put the session data in with, uh, with 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 codes that change each day and it may um that answer some questions that are fireproof exactly <laughs> yeah. um there's there are some questions about excuse me about um doing some work and work from home um mm -hmm. obviously security once you're at your your part of the industry does become a a significant um not obstacle but something that you have to work around so i just wanted if you could give us a little bit of a look into what some of that security is for you absolutely um our clients rely on us to keep their media secure we are also under two uh very strict codes of practice one is the mpaa which stands for the motion picture association of america and also the NP, ah uh, no, that's Netflix MP3. Um, I forgot. Sorry, I forgot the other one. I left my notes. But what what those standards require are locked doors, blacked out windows, um, multiple authentication on workstations, and things like that. What COVID did was it made what we've been looking at for years. It just hit fast forward on that because. We still needed to complete work and deliver work, but there was no way we could compromise on security. And it took a lot of work from the IT&E team here at Deluxe in Sydney and also Deluxe in LA and, and globally is to find a solution so that we could keep our staff safe and they could work from home. You know, there was that three month period where, you know, Sydney was, you know, things haven't been as bad as in Sydney as they were in Melbourne for Drew and, and those guys. but. Um, we had to quickly develop and work with Avid a system in that we could get the content in and still have people be able to work from home, but maintain that high level of security. And everything you mentioned is true. I was um, lucky enough to work on a couple of seasons of Game of Thrones and I never saw a frame of picture. The, the audio asset and the video asset was split. They were, you know, encrypted on drives, you know, all of those things um, were done. There were also lots of other things that I can't mention, but um, there are many, many steps um, in keeping that content secure and also keeping it um, safe until the release date. Um, and it requires steps from everybody in the ecosystem to adhere to those rules and abide by them to ensure that that content is kept safe. We now have a system in place where if an operator needs to work from home for a health reason or for whatever else, we have a method that they are able to access the content, but it isn't in their possession and it's encrypted and it's spoiled and there are multiple things. By spoiled, I mean uh, picture spoiling, which can be uh, red lines across the screen, uh, embossed codes. There's also QR codes that can be embedded in picture so they can, you know, if that picture was to ever be stolen or, you know, acquired, the client is able to track it back through those methodologies. And they're, they're, they're well known and they're well documented. Um, and yes, that's right. We've also had to install cameras in, you know, 
pretty much everywhere in the facility, and that's 24-7. Um, there's another you know, sort of funny thing that happens is if I forget my swipe card, I forget. I just turn the car around, go home, and pick it up. It's not even worth getting to the front door because to get to my suite, there's seven swipe doors. <laughs> that's the level of security that you're sort of dealing with. And it, it needs to be that way. And that's why, you know, our networks are locked down and you can't access the internet from this room. And, you know, as I was saying before, today's setup in this room had to be specifically set up, mm. you know, with multiple networks and, you know, security permissions from the, the it and &E group. And, you know, they do a fantastic job of, of keeping our content safe. Um, and there's also the physical things that I mentioned is blacked out windows, swipe carded doors, um, all those sort of things go together to keeping content safe for, for our clients. So I, I'll just touch on one thing quickly. There's some great questions and I don't do want to get to them. Um, is that we, obviously there's the audio stuff and I think the education courses do a great job of um, teaching fundamentals in audio. Mm -hmm. What is audio? How does audio propagate in air and what is compression and all these things. But we've talked a couple of times today about new technologies. Um, mm -hmm. things like IT, networking, yep. new audio over IP standards. I think one a bit of advice that I would probably get, give is that um, you really have to keep up on, on those things. And actually, if you get yourself, for example, just as an example, if you did your like Dante certification up to three or something yep. like that, which is a bit of work, mm -hmm. um, but that would potentially give you something that you can offer a mixer that maybe hasn't had the time to do that yet you can bring in a new skill and i think that's something to to not forget is there's a lot of other areas related around audio that are becoming more and more important absolutely you you you're spot on um the one bit of advice i would give to to everyone who's looking at entering the the audio industry be that of onset location recording or post-production or radio or whatever part of audio you want to go into is start to learn the fundamentals of the technology and also networking. Um, you know, all of the new Avid work surfaces rely on a set network. You need to know what an IP address is and how it, how it works. And that's on top of all the audio basics that you learn. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, you can, you could, there is so much information on the internet and the Dante course is, is actually something our whole work group here and our IT and E group are going to go and do in, or well, not go and do, we're going to be in our rooms and do it in December because COVID's not going to be over by then. Um, we're going to do it virtually and learn about that technology because it's emerging. Avid have integrated it into the MTRX studio and the MTRX box. It's something we need to know. And it's also something that our IT and E guys, and if um, anyone doesn't know, is information technology and engineering. And they're, they're two different disciplines, but they come together when it comes to post-production. And, you know, we rely on those guys um, to set those networks up and look after them. But one of my real sort of best bits of advice is that as much as you may want to specialize in something, mm -hmm. learn as much as you can about everything. Um, because you never know when it's going to become, when it's going to come in handy. You may be able to solve a problem or you may be able to assist on a project where someone who's sort of specialized and blinkered down on, if they just want to be a dialogue editor, that's great. But try and learn as much as you can about everything in audio. Because if it's your passion, it should be easy for you to, you know, pick up a book or take a course or look online. Like, you know, it's amazing the amount of content that's been created by people on YouTube about, you know, really complex topics that you can go back and you can take notes. And I encourage people to do that. You know, it's, it's something that will help you get a foot in the door and also maintain employment. You know, I know guys that are just as good as recording location dialogue as they are at editing it and mixing it. And they're the kind of people who are able to stay employed and also, you know, really be able to bring value to a project. It doesn't matter if it's a podcast or a feature film. 
the more you know, the more you can contribute, and the more you can help. And it's, you know, I'll put my hand up, it's one thing that because my role has sort of expanded uh, recently and it has a, a very wide remit, is I miss my study time. You know, I, I used to really set aside, you know, sort of Saturday morning, Saturday lunchtime to try and get as many white papers from SEMPTI and from the Cinema Audio Society and read as much about the new technology as I can. Um, but unfortunately, time these days doesn't permit. But it's something that I want, be, because I sort of didn't work from home during the COVID crisis, I had to sort of be on deck to manage people working from home. Um, it's something I want to get back to. And, and there are big gaps in my in my sort of IP knowledge and my networking knowledge. And they're things that I want to fill in um, over the next couple of months. But, you know, it's something that will be valuable and will add um, to what I can contribute and also to be able to problem solve. Um, and as I said before, it goes from an artist series mixed surface all the way up to the S6 that you've got behind you. It's all based on IP technology. Yeah. It, it is. And I, I think probably, although my accent's changing, you can probably tell I'm a New Zealander. Um, the uh, the um, being in New Zealand and probably Australia, um, I, mm -hmm. I think we've had a bit of an advantage in that you kind of do have to do a bit of everything. Absolutely. And it is quite difficult to to specialize in just one area and when i came to a i'm in japan now uh, when i came to a much bigger country in some ways i was a little surprised that people were so uh in one particular area of of, of the industry where i felt like um you know if you have that knowledge even if it's just to a basic level you have so much more to contribute so i think that's really good advice about yeah. making sure you have a wide view of the industry absolutely and and one of my um sort of best experiences working you know here, here at deluxe was i had the opportunity to be a pro tools operator for a great mixer by the name of geth and craig um he's mixed on lord of the rings and thousands of other other things but um he hadn't worked you know this is a long time ago he hadn't worked on an icon before and so he really wanted to learn the icon side of things and what my role was was to be his operator so that he had the tracks underneath his fingers, ready to mix. And by doing that, and by being able to operate Pro Tools without having my hands on the faders and being quick, um, and offering that assistance to him, I was able to see the way he worked. And it's it's a it's an experience, it was on a film called Tracks, and if you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's an amazing story about uh, a lady who walked with camels across the Australian desert, um, and uh, I've forgotten her name, but it's a long time ago, but it's a fantastic film. And I just learned so much by contributing through my Pro Tools knowledge, but watching him do what he did by being a, a true mixer. Um, and, you know, now Geffen can do everything and doesn't need <laughs> at all to help him with anything. But um, that was one great experience that, that I really treasure. And, and it's a real bond is that when you can be someone's operator and preempt what they're going to want you know by watching how they work and it took a couple of days for us to get in sync but once we were in sync it was just fluid and and it worked we, we did that for six weeks and it was a great experience i really really enjoyed that yeah and before we jump into these questions mm -hmm. uh, i thought one thing that was really interesting and i think drew myself um yourself and i did spot aussie sutherland uh, in in the question somewhere um is we've been really lucky that this industry has afforded us in these jobs has afforded us some really amazing opportunities um it, it takes quite a lot of dedication and hard work to get there but um i, I think you know in in our careers there's a few times where we we have some kind of like wow moments and i thought it'd be cool to maybe just share a couple of those um with with the people watching if there's a couple that that you have in mind i know i've got a couple um that i've got in mind um of things like wow this is really cool by following my audio passion i've been able to do this this really cool thing um so i wondered if you i can go first you can go first up up to you my friend. i i have an idea of what yours is and yours is so brilliant you go <laughs> first because because mine pale into insignificance because i'm jealous of yours go wow. ahead daniel <laughs> well there's there's 
one, the opportunity is, is, you know, I still work in the industry, but what being passionate and involved in this industry has done for me, one, it's provided a living. Um, We're lucky. Second, we We're are. lucky. And uh, it's given me the opportunity to travel all around the world. Um, obviously, right now, that's not an option, but uh, visited dozens and dozens of countries, places I never would have imagined I'd, I would go to. But a couple of specific, like, wow, this moment. Um, when I was back in, in New Zealand um, doing uh, television and radio, we had an amazing experience to record um, Muhammad Ali and more specifically his wife on his behalf. And that was a really great moment saying, wow, we, we got to touch or be in have a moment in time where we were with uh, these in these people's life. And the other one was more recent. And I don't know if Drew's got a, a picture there. Um, is on, being Drew, able to make us all jealous is being able to um is visit skywalker um sound out at uh at skywalker ranch and um we had an amazing opportunity to go through the facility and actually sit down in the screening room um there, there I am. Um, the screening room there, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell by the building, actually, but there's a number of dub stages. There's a huge screening room. Uh, it's a really, really impressive um, complex. A and actually sit down and watch, um, gosh, probably about 30 or 40 minutes across the um, different Star Wars um, movies. And as a Star Wars fan, you can see, uh, oh, what's that way? That way, that way. little R2-D2 behind me there. Uh, that, that was a moment that sort of transcended just being in the business it's like wow this this is um really great so that that's a couple for me i, I wanted glenn also if you had a couple to share well I'd, I'd mentioned my one my star wars one before was meeting steve maslow um back in 2015 um and spending time with him talking about star wars y you know it, it was such a landmark film and you think it was the 70s there i am with steve there he is he's a legend um we went out to that was that was after lunch um <laughs> yeah it, it, as i said before he'd answered thousands of questions about star wars but took the, you know took the time out to explain things to me and and the way they worked back then you know just was you know impossible to imagine just due to the density you know, that that soundtrack i was lucky enough um my wife bought me the D, the DVD that had the remaster but also had the original theatrical version on it and that's the one I really wanted yeah. and when you listen to that theatrical one you know at home you know at a good volume that soundtrack still stands up today you know mm. it could go up against anything and they were you know cutting 35 mil neg and, and, and sound designing that way they weren't sitting in Pro Tools with unlimited number of tracks um, the other wow moments um have been uh, again they were all you know thankfully Ozzy Sutherland that you mentioned before he really helped me um, meet some incredible people and it was to visit you know Technicolor on the Paramount lot and Sony and to be able to see those rooms and um, you know to be able to see it was at the time 2015 was the time when uh, Sony were moving out some of their legacy consoles and moving in some of the S6 consoles right. and to see those constructed at the front of the at the front of the the dub stage ready for them to be moved back because they were they were partway through a mix um, and to be able to um, meet Greg Russell um, while he was mixing the intro to I think it was Terminator Genesis mm -hmm. um, again you know massive film huge dub stage you know a lot of money going on but still stopped and took the time and said hey you know come in sit down sit next to me you know I'll, I'll mix this scene you know if you've got any questions just let me know when we get to the end of the reel and oh by reel i mean uh, films because they're so large they're divided into it goes back to the days of you know 35 mil real films they're divided into about 20 minute segments so uh, a major feature film will have up to you know maybe seven or eight reels and they're worked on in that size just so they're in manageable chunks um, and everyone can contribute to that sort of 20 minute section and then when the film's ready to be completed those reels are stitched together to create the continuous um, you know Greg, Greg Russell there and um, also seeing Greg Rudloff work 
on um, on the, the Warner stage was was incredible, and and going through all those big Hollywood facilities, um, you know, it was just a a real eye opener. But again, I come back to the fact of yes, I was intimidated because of the talent in the room, but I felt comfortable being in the room and actually being able to learn things because I knew Pro Tools. They were all using Pro Tools. The consoles were different in each different room because different mixers have things that, you know, have reasons for working on surfaces they want to work on. But being able to see Pro Tools and see how it was being manipulated, I just learned so much from that. And it really was, I had to I had to pinch myself. Um, yeah. You know, going to the, the Clint Eastwood stage and the Barbara Streisand scoring stage and, you know, just the history of everything there um, really was... Uh, in 2015, that that trip was just incredible, and that was all, you know, made possible by by Ozzy. Um, you know, he introduced me to all those people, and I'll I'll forever be grateful um, for for that. You know, he really he's a good guy. Indeed, indeed, he is. So um, let's um, jump over to some of the questions. I think I mean we, we've got a good amount in there. And want to try and answer them as many as we can. I mm -hmm. think uh, Drew and Shauna have been actively answering the questions that they can um, about where you can go to courses and a, a few things like that. Hey, Drew. That, hey, I was just going to jump in and say good day. And I was going to say there has been a lot of questions that are somewhat have the same answer, and they're in regards to um, you know preparing yourself to get into the world, maybe looking at internships, what you should be doing to um to prepare yourself if you want to approach a, a company about an internship and mm -hmm. also you know what you know what facilities may be doing internships at the moment especially with COVID happening mm -hmm. um you know any advice to you know students coming out of uni or they want to get an internship or do some work experience what should they do look that's uh, the one question at, everyone's asking at the moment i don't have I'm going to be completely honest with you. Um, I don't have good news on that front. I know for a fact that um, many major facilities and also a lot of the smaller facilities are very much locked down until we see what's happening with COVID. Um, you know, currently at Deluxe, um, we can't have visitors on site. We can't have clients on site. Um, and that's made business really difficult for us. It's there to protect our staff. You know, they're our number one asset. You know, this room's great, but it's just a big room unless there's someone here to operate it or help other people operate it. Um, some of the world's biggest films have been put on hiatus because of COVID. Um, you know, you look at the, the Elvis biopic being shot up in uh, the Gold Coast, you know, but that took, had to take a, a long break. Um, I don't know when that's going to be lifted. You know, I hope for humanity that, you know, we can come out of this with a vaccine or with, you know, whatever, but I don't want to get political about it. But um, I honestly don't know what um, our competition are doing in the US um, or any other facilities doing, but I know in Australia it's very much a tight lockdown. And I know for our LA facility, which is called Seward Street, which is in the old classic Glen Glen building that they used to shoot Happy Days and they've mixed hundreds of thousands of films that used to be uh, Todd AO Studios as well. Um, they're in lockdown with skeletal staff, you know, just essential staff keeping the rooms running and things like that. Um, what I would say to people coming out of uni is use this time that you can't get an internship to absolutely bolster your knowledge in everything to do with audio. And um, I had a, had a great mentor and he, he had this, this thing of being a complete engineer. You know, so many people claim to be a sound engineer, but they don't know how to do, you know, they don't know how to record dialogue or they don't know how to, you know, record a voiceover or they don't know how to cut whatever. I would invest this time wisely, you know, both with book smarts and also as much practical um, experience as you can get. You know, that that Netflix um, package, that, that template package would be a great start. You know, when I was starting out, I would have killed for something like that. Um, you know, that would have been the whole grail is to get hold of a, a complete mix. Get hold of that content and learn it, you know, back to front. Even with, you know, a Pro Tools subscription, which is now affordable. You know, back when I was a student, 
you know, I, I just couldn't afford Pro Tools. I was, you know, I could only work a certain amount of hours a day and do study and, and there was no way I could afford it. Pro Tools has never been more accessible and never been more affordable. You know, with an iLock and a laptop, you can do what it used to take to do on a full HD, you know, TDM system. Um, and so there, there's no excuse, you know, the, the, the price of entry is so low now. I, I'm not good on my RRPs for, for subscriptions, but I know it's, yeah, the last time I saw it, it's, it's affordable month to month. And if you can't afford it one month, you just don't pay, you don't have access to it. And then the next month when you can afford it, you can just pay the subscription again, and, you know, pick up your subscription then. Use this time wisely. Learn as much as you can about the industry. But when COVID does lift, my best advice to you is to find the facilities that are working on the content or the type of content that you want to work on and write them a letter. Like, don't email them because emails end up in junk folders. Just ask the person you know, who's answering the phone at the front desk or, you know, at their, their call center or whatever, and just say, look, uh, I need to get in touch with your head of audio or your production manager. Write them a letter because no one does it. People send emails, people try and call, they get lost, they get buried. I get 250 emails a day that need to be actioned just because Deluxe is a global company, you know, we work on a 24 hour, you know, schedule, the sun never sets, you know, something's always being in production. Um, and you know, that, that's, that would be one way of getting somebody's attention is saying, Hey, I'm writing to you. Here's what I want to try and experience. Here's what I'm prepared to offer. Um, would you be prepared to take me on? But I know for a fact at the moment, there's nobody who would be offering, um, internships at all i don't even think australia's public broadcasters um don't quote me but i haven't seen any you know opportunities with the abc or the sbs um or new zealand's public broadcaster for that matter um where they would usually have an intake of you know five or six production uh students that's just not happening this year and it's just because it's it's covid you know i know everyone uses it as an excuse but you know, we're locked down. And for the minute, that would be my best advice to you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's um, some really good advice in there. Um, take the time, use the time, um, yep. work on projects. Um, look, if you've got, make friends with editors, they'll have something that you can help them on. Um, have some examples ready when that opportunity does pop up and someone yeah. says, what have you worked on? Have you ever done Foley? Have you done footsteps? Have you mixed a music track? You want the answer to be yes, even if it's just an independent thing or something that you've helped someone on. Uh, if those opportunities uh, come up, uh, definitely take them because they will, they will just put you that extra step further Absolutely. when it comes to the to the day when you have to sit in front of a console or in front of Pro Tools and get some work done. Absolutely. Be that person who has the content ready. Don't be like, oh yeah, I can I can put it together this weekend. If someone says, have you got it? Boom. There's a link. There's a USB. You know, go to, you know, YouTube. If you've got, you can set up a private YouTube account where that, you know, gives them an access code and they can just get straight to it. The other thing is, it's a huge investment but there's a great book called The Practical Art of Motion Picture Sound. And I've forgotten who the author is. I should have been more prepared because I didn't think it was going to come up. But um, it's called The Practical Art of Motion Picture Sound. And it's it's a volume. It's a, it's a big, big book about all facets of motion picture sound. Um, you know, just try and collaborate on projects, as, as Daniel said. Um, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's synced to picture, it doesn't matter if it's a podcast, you know, someone will be able to tell, you know, anyone who knows what they're talking about will be able to tell your level, level of aptitude by the work you're able to produce as a, as a demo. Um, and that's another thing is, you know, don't rely on someone else to cut your demo reel. Um, there's a version of Media Composer, you know, same with Pro Tools. There's Pro Tools First that's free to download. There's also Media Composer. Um, my, I was very, very lucky. I had one of the best Media Composer guys teach me Media Composer, Mike Baber, uh, who's at uh, Macquarie Uni. Um, you know, we had some downtime with work, and I said to him, all right, 
I need you to teach me media composer and because he's an authorized um, avid instructor he said all right I'm going to sit down and teach an audio guy <laughs> media composer and I was then confident to be able to cut my own demo reel from mm. the media that I had that's another thing that you can do is if you can't find an editor to work with get all your content together download media composer first and put your own reel together and just put it at the end you know sound design and mix done by joe you know real cut by joe that shows that you're then able to and i think we spoke about this this recently is the more you know about the other side of the production process the more empowered you are to be able to actively ask for what you need to do your job mm -hmm. and daniel had a great example is there's a thing called when a picture is cut you've got a cut here and you've got a cut there and either side of that when you are editing audio it's called handles and you want what happened a couple of seconds before that edit and a couple of seconds after because what it will help you do is to be able to bridge your dialogue together or to be able to edit the scene together cleanly so the dialogue doesn't go stop right where the picture cut is and so learning how to export an AAF you know that's it's still the 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 standard for exporting over to sound or doing a sound turnover is knowing what the those terminologies are they're covered in all of um, the Avid uh, Pro Tools training, you know, as you progress through and branch into post, um, that will just empower you so much more to be able to ask for what you need instead of going, oh, the bit before the cut, maybe I might need that. You can confidently say to the picture editor on email or if you're working in the same facility, hey, I need five second handles on this hand handles on this handover do you mind doing that for me mm -hmm. and they know what that is they'll be able to export that file for you or if they don't know what it is and you do you'll be able to go and show them and say hey you know can we make this a standard for this show um yeah i really need that to be able to do my job effectively i, I certainly remember having never touched media composer at that stage knowing what the export settings were yeah to tell the editor over the phone, oh, I need AIFC, I need it to be consolidated, I need handles, um, make sure you do a render or the offline uh, effects otherwise. Yep. So the speed ramps that editors love to use, we will get yep. the wrong audio and things like that. So it, that's that's an excellent bit of advice. It's, it's the same as learning about the network stuff as well. The, the more well-rounded you can be, the more helpful you are when you're in that room. Um, so, and I'm not I'm not discouraging anyone from from specialising, but f follow that passion of speciali specialisation, but also know as much as you can about the rest of the process, so that you can be an active participant and a valued positive participant in the process. Yeah. So, um, slightly different topic. Um, mm -hmm. it's a good one though. How do you protect your hearing during audio work? My ears uh, hurt after get painful after working on um, raw field recordings for many hours. So um, I'll have a go at it first. Um, I don't do as much long um, in front of, I, I work on sound design and mixing occasionally, but not as much as I used to, but there was certainly a stage where I was mixing. Uh, what, what do we, what do we say? The, the correct word is uh, lifestyle television. So unscripted yes, 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 television, unscripted, unscripted television and lifestyle is the yeah. official terminology for, and we're doing, you know, sort of 10, 12 hours a day. And, and you're really at your limit there for ears. I'll be interested to hear Glenn's opinion as well. But there's actually quite a well-known phenomenon that if you listen to audio for a long amount of time at quite high SPL, your response to the frequencies actually changes. And while you can work around it, um, I learned quite early in my career that I would go back to something in the morning. I'd been up late doing the night before and it was extremely bright because I just like my ears were getting dull as they because kind of naturally they compressed. Fatigued. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and so um, certainly when you get to a stage um, of Glenn's size, there will be um, workplace health and safety. I forget the name of it in um, Australia that will probably have quite strict um, time limits as well as SPL levels at the mix position. Um, so I, I don't have a super specific answer for a home situation, but I would say just be cautious about 
how long you're doing it because you're not necessarily even doing your best work if you're just hammering away at the audio for extremely a long amounts of time at high level. I tend to keep it lower um, while I'm doing a lot of the work. And then when I need to listen back in a more critical situation, have like a reference level for that if I'm working on one thing um, all day long. So yeah, I'm interested what you have to say as well, Glenn. Absolutely. It, it's something I'm really passionate about is because the thing is, without your hearing, you have no career. Um, and I've seen some terrible things happen in post. And you, the the person who asked the question was saying, you know, listening back to raw location recordings. Um, my first port of call when I'm listening back to raw location recordings is dim, is because you don't know what was captured, you know, how loud it is, how soft it is, or anything else like that. Um, whenever I'm working on this stage, so for theatrical mixes, the standard is 85 dB SPL, so sound pressure level. And that is also on the Dolby interface as considered Dolby 7. So it's theatrical standard. When you're working on near field content, whether it's a, a DVD, a Blu-ray, lifestyle unscripted television, um, for the standard there, that's 79 um, dB SPL. That is a high level to be listening to all day long. And there are, OH, I think it was oh and you were looking for. The yeah. workplace safety thing there is a fantastic graph of what they call it is dosage and exposure and anytime that i'm not actually working on the tools in the stage um, i went and invested in uh, molded earplugs and they're fantastic um, they're made by a company called resound and having the mold done isn't the most comfortable thing in the world but once you get them, they're molded to your ears. And what they do is it's just like an enormous volume knob. So you don't lose any of the top end frequencies or the mid mid range frequencies for dialogue or the bottom end. It just sounds like the world's being turned down and they are the best. They're not cheap They're I believe mine were about $200, but I saved up for them because I knew I was going to be in this environment and if you're walking around assisting people, you're still able to hear dialogue and, and people talking to you very clearly, but it's just at a softer level because although the crew might change out on the stage, you know, if it's a back-to-back -back mix, they might do their eight or 12 hour day and then a new crew comes in and you're still teching for them or looking after the Pro Tools or making sure the room's running, you're exposed to that dosage of very high SPL for 14, 16 hours, and, and that is detrimental. That is where hearing loss starts to, to happen. And to have a long career, my best advice to you is, is when you are pulling in those raw location files, is bring the volume down or dim the console or dim whatever you're listening to. Usually, by default, it's uh, 20, 20 dB, I think, it yeah, pulls it yeah. down by. Um, and then you're able to have a listen to it. I've also got another theory, and this comes back to my whole audio file thing is a good song is a good song at full volume as it is at half volume you're able to hear the detail and you know the depth of the mix even at a low volume and when you're doing your first passes on handovers AAF handovers um, it can be a real minefield because picture editors can use volume automation or gain um, using the gain in, in the Avid to pull the gain right down, the clip gain on those files, you don't know what's contained in those. So when you take that clip gain off, it could be just you know a truck passing it, you know, 100 dB. You need to be really careful about those things. And another thing is, is to start looking at waveforms. That's where you can really yeah. judge what's loud, what's quiet. Um, you know, if you've got this big block waveform, you know that it's loud and you know that it's going on for X amount of time. Um, and that would be my best advice. I still use those earplugs now. If I get a raw handover from a picture editor who I don't know and I don't know how they work, the earplugs go in, I open it up, you know, dim the console and just start having a listen through it and see what level things are sitting at um, so that I can judge you know, where I'm, I'm going to do it, you know, where I'm going to listen to it at before I start really crafting the mix. Um, and that, that's my best advice on that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, the waveform thing, I think 
when when you've sat in front of Pro Tools long enough, you you can just about read. Oh yeah, read it. I mean, you can see the breaths for sure, but you can yep. just about read what people are saying just by looking at the waveforms. It's a it's a really interesting thing, and a, another another reason why why people use it um, that that representation becomes becomes everything really. Um, so a really interesting question, getting back to education a bit, and this is something um, I've I've heard before, and it's a why do you think there's a gap between what education facilities teach and the skills needed to begin working in the industry? It seems to be a, a wide scale issue. So I certainly have some opinion about that. And I think really one is what you learn, the fundamentals and the, the test you pass is, is one part of it, but that communication and working with other people, I really think is is the biggest difference. You'll get better as time goes on just by practice. But the pressure of having a producer or a director sitting behind you, working to a time schedule, um, that that kind of pressure, I think that's really where there's a huge separation. Um, remember, someone's once you're out of school and you're working professionally, someone's paying you to do to do a job. And when you say, I think this is going to take an hour or three hours or a week or whatever that's got to be a, a well-educated guess because or, or well not even guess you've got to be able to plan that out because the the pressure around producing that content and the time that you've committed to impacts everything else after you so if you just it's that taking a really professional attitude and and learning to communicate really well so if you can ever set up that scenario i think it'd be a great bit of advice for any teachers out there and i'm sure they try and do it but set up scenarios where someone is the director someone is the producer and that they are requesting certain things that a person would do as as glenn said earlier you can't be too precious about it you're working collaboratively on a project it's not just yours and it's not just for marks on a test it's someone else's creative vision that you're contributing to and i think that's really where the biggest gap is not that they're not teaching the right things it's that there's the communication and the the fact people are paying you money to do this thing so that that's sort of my feeling on it glenn i yeah I'm interested no, no, to hear. I, I completely agree with you and and the thing is that the one thing that you can do for yourself and you know we were saying before by being self-motivated and making opportunities for yourself is set yourself a time goal and, you know, I always take my watch off, put it on the console. I'm like, right, by two o'clock, this needs to be printed. If it's not, why, ha why haven't I been able to achieve that? What, what roadblocks have been there? I can only speak to the afters experience, which um, I, I can't fault. Um, they have that sort of um, system where as you work through the year, the years and you're learning those skills, at the end of each year, you have a, a, a class project and it's not sort of the audio class, it's the picture editors, the directors, the, the cinematographers and uh, set design and all of those different film disciplines come together and the people who have done the directing course or the producing course have a script, they go out and shoot it and then you have a very strict um, time schedule to get that project completed. And you do have that person sitting over your shoulder um, for the period of the mix. You get time on your own to do the sound editorial and do the ADR and do the pickups and everything else you need to do. But then at the end of that process, when it comes to mixing it, you do have that person um, sitting over your shoulder. Um, I would use the, the... I don't think there's a big gap in what's being taught. It is just a matter of condensing it so that you work and you set your own goals as to what you want to achieve and make them realistic and then start to bring that time down so that you're fast, you're efficient and you're, you're productive in that time. Um, and if the school or the college or the university doesn't offer something like that, ask someone in one of the other disciplines, go, hey, you know, do you want to put something together? It doesn't have to be a 20 minute you know, short, it can be a 10 minute spot on a script, they can go out and shoot it. And you will find by asking people and being proactive, you'll be the person that they come back and ask, Hey, you know, I've got this coming up. And it even happens now. I'm, you know, although I can't, 
work on things externally from Deluxe, I still get people that I went to, to AFTA's email me saying, hey, you know, can you recommend anybody? And it's those sort of networking opportunities that you develop through university or your sound school that will carry over through into your career. Um, so if those opportunities aren't being made, I recommend that you, you make those opportunities for yourself um, and, and try and set up those scenarios where you're making that happen. No, absolutely. Um, an interesting question there, which you'd be a, a great person to answer, is um, you talked about reels in yes. the in the session, and um, if they're separated out, how do you stitch those together so that they feel uh, seamless? Is the question there? That is a dark art. So okay. um, it, it's uh, what happens is at at the start of every reel, there is a head pip. So a two pip and at the tail, there's a tail pop. And so you use those markers. So it's just a one kilohertz tone that goes dip, dip. You've heard them on TV, you know, sort of used in comedic fashion, um, is that you then join that back. So you'll have a first frame of action and a last frame of action. And that's usually listed by um, an online editor. And that's actually one thing we didn't get around to, Daniel, is that an online editor that I worked with mm. who was unfortunately made redundant, he came to me and said, look, you know, I, I don't have work. Um, you know, is there anything I can do? I have passion for music. And I said to him, here's the 101 book. Go learn that and we might be able to talk. He's now a midline operator for me. So that's someone who went through the avid process of education and actually flipped it. And we worked on hundreds of TV shows together. And he's, he's a great operator, a really nice guy, Christian. Um, but that's an example of how the avid education program can take someone with knowledge of post-production and knowledge of um, picture and audio and flip those skills into a completely new career. And he's been with us now for four years as, a, as an audio op instead of an online op. But you, from your online editor, you will receive a first frame of action and a last frame of action. And that is for each reel. And then you join those together using that methodology. So reel one is here and reel two is here. And then you bring reel two into line with reel one and you match the first frame of action and the last frame of action. Now, that is why handles and also running over the cut point or the last frame of image is essential because you don't want the audio to stop bang on the last frame of image because you need a way of blending that together. And when you've done the, the print master and you've got your stems, that's where you sort of use um, those sort of handles coming back into the reels as a way of blending those reels together and making reel joins um, seamless is a real art. There's you know, it, it, it takes time to do it, but once you've done it a couple of times, it becomes second nature and you know what sounds will be um, easy to blend and difficult to blend. And it's a it's a, a thing for picture editors to think about is trying not to make a real break while there's dialogue. That's the most impossible thing to do and the most difficult thing to do. Yes, it has been done, but it's just not the easiest thing to do. So um, that's a great one for for all the picture editors is try and avoid your real breaks on um, on dialogue because it makes it difficult when it comes time to stitch those reels together. So some of the best editors, you know what they've done. You can always see a real break coming up because they've got to cut away to a, an external shot where you can just blend those atmospheres or those backgrounds, the wind and the you know whatever else you're using as backgrounds to make a really, really smooth reel join. Cool. But that okay. was actually one of my questions when I was first starting out. It, it absolutely broke my brain. I'm like, okay, so it's going from six different bits and you have to put it together. How on earth does that work? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that is also something that's covered in the um, mo the Art of Motion Picture Sound book is, is you're managing real joins and managing real breaks. Um, and he, he goes into to great depth about that. It's really good. Yeah, now I'm um, talking specifically about getting a little bit more into um, specific Pro Tools operation. We are looking at um, planning uh, what we're going to call a student demo day or something similar to that. So mm -hmm. uh, will we actually start getting into some um, Pro Tools uh, operation and looking at some 
uh, tips, tricks, and, and hints um, there. So please look out uh, for that. Um, I just wanted to do a quick uh, screen share here, if I can. Um, one of the questions, um, Glenn, I think you sent through some photos to Drew. I'm not sure if he's got them, but um, I've. it was a question about um, coloring and organizing um, all of your tracks and how you might go about that. That's and, definitely uh, not mine. <laughs> um th no this is mine this is um this is just a tv commercial i worked on um and they said do you divide things up into colors using color palettes oh yeah um and and absolutely um this is an example of of a tv this is a tv commercial that played in japan actually um and as you can see I've, i'm actually using one of the newer features from pro tools where i'm actually using the folder functionality but if i open these out you can actually see the different atmospheres um, and also all of my different um, foley and then i've got a whole thing dedicated to whooshes because it was a very sound effects heavy um, mix so i wanted to be able to dip those down together but absolutely i'm um, color coding uh, for me and everyone i've come across in the industry is absolutely um critical and, and it has to be really clear because you often have to hand these sessions over to to other people so um yeah um definitely color coding the new folder track functionality has also made it um nice to to tidy and organize things so as glenn said we're always adding new things to mm. to pro tools and um these are some of the 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 kinds of tips and tricks that we'd, we'd love to share with everyone um absolutely we've got and the opportunity and that's one thing, Daniel, that we haven't dived into here as yet at, at Deluxe in Sydney is that we haven't upgraded to the most recent version of Pro Tools is because because we have, you know, uh, 12 uh, Pro Tools seats in the facility and they all work together. We need to make sure that when the next version of Pro Tools comes out, that it does everything we need to do and it works with our operating system and it works with all of our other software. So that's one thing that we always find we're about three months behind on is that even though we've got the support plan for having the new pro tools that will go onto our test bench machine and then when we've proven it there that's when we roll it out to all the suites because we just want to make sure we know you know if there's any sort of gremlins or anything like that in the system that it's worked out before we deploy it so that's why we're always about three sort of three months behind on each each release schedule so we haven't tackled um, folder tracks yet but it's yeah. I've done it at home and it's awesome and it's definitely well worth learning because it makes managing your sessions so much easier you know where you had to used to cram everything where you couldn't even read the labels in now as you saw in Daniel's session he had I think it was uh, the blue impact subs yeah you know that was really easy to see and if that blue impact uh, well if a sub sound was too loud in the mix and the client went oh gee the boom was a bit loud Blue impact subs, boom, straight down, tuck it in, you know, bring the volume down, move on, problem solved, you know, and that's, it's efficiencies in coloring. And I don't know, there's no real standard. I've sort of seen lots of mixes and lots of editors. Um, I've got mine. I know what works to the way my brain works, the way I color code things. But once you've seen someone session, you're like, like when you, as soon as you brought it up, I went, that's not mine. Cause I just know yeah. that they're not my colors. Yeah. Um, is that you know once you've seen it someone's session you'll be able to navigate it really quickly and and that's that's a great thing with pro tools and especially now with the the nesting folders that's awesome and we're looking forward to using it i just wanted to ask shauna a quick quick question as if i could we still got some great questions um there how are we for time i, I know glenn and i are okay um what's what how are we going shauna <laughs> um yeah so we've gone over uh, a bit <laughs> which is completely fine though like we we appreciate both of your time so um i'm happy to keep this continuing again this will be it is live and it will be mm -hmm. uh, sent out as an on-demand recording for everyone yeah. to kind of do or share around to your friends and stuff like that so if you guys want to keep going for like another say 10 minutes i know we've got a couple of questions if you want to get yeah. through them yeah. also yeah. be sharing oh at the end so all good awesome okay um so I was um, going sorry to i was going to go, chime go in there were, there were uh, some more comments um through the other socials and that we're working on um about mentorships um right. as far as what avenues are available for say students or people starting the industry industry to you know maybe look for a mentor i know there are organizations 
uh, that all of us are a part of that might mm-hmm. be a great avenue for students to to go into. Like I know Glenn, you know, we always hang out at the ASSG SSG. awards. You know, that maybe. Do you want to maybe talk about that for maybe a, a potential place for students to maybe meet a mentor? Yeah, absolutely. The thing is that yeah, again, COVID. Thanks very much for twenty twenty. Um, that's one thing that won't be sort of happening this year. But by being part or by joining the ASSG, um, the Australian Screen Sound Guild, um, you know, it doesn't matter what stage you are in your career. You, you know, as a student member, you will be welcomed with open arms and it will give you access to people who you otherwise might not meet on the day to day. Again, the awards aren't going ahead this year, but if you were to email them, um, I believe Steve Murphy Smurf is the president. I also think he is now the head of Sound at Afters, maybe. I don't know for sure, but, um, correct. correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, he would be a great person to email and say, Hey, here's what I've done. Here's what I'm looking to do. Would you be able to recommend someone when the COVID thing is over that I can, I can speak to, or I can spend a day with, or, you know, something like that. Um, you know, this, this whole lockdown thing has really made things difficult for students. And and I really feel, you know, I had challenges when I was, I was coming up, but this is such, you know, again, it's an overused thing. You know, this is unprecedented. It's never happened before. And it really hasn't. Um, and the problem is everyone's just trying to keep safe and, and try and survive and keep work going through that. It's really difficult you know, to do a mentorship or, or anything like that, but maybe something that could be set up. And I'm, I'm certainly not speaking for the ASSG here. I'm literally just idea throwing is, you know, maybe a zoom meeting with someone who is an expert in the field that you want to specialize in, um, Again, we talked about people in the industry being really nice and those who rise to the top are the easiest to get along with and and work with and collaborate with. Um, I am sure that if you went through the correct channels with the ASSG, um, they would be able to set something up like that. You know, that's the one great thing about, the only great thing about this, (laughs) this COVID thing is that, you know, Zoom meetings like this usually you know, hopefully Daniel could be here and Drew could be there and we could hang out and we could chat, but we're doing it over Zoom and that's maybe a way that you can have access to people that you wouldn't otherwise have access to, um, to be able to ask questions or, you know, set up a session and say, hey, you know, is this something, is this the way you would work or would you please be able to have a look at the way I've done this? And and maybe we get in touch with the ASSG and say, hey, is this something you'd be prepared to support? Because, you know, the guild is there for everybody at, at whatever stage of the career, their career that they're at. And, and that could be, be something helpful. Um, so, yeah, let's take that one on notice and, and float it. I have been getting emails from the ASSG in regards to uh, Soundbar, which is uh, just over Zoom beers with yeah, uh, yes, it's the- just an informal chat with uh, other ASSG members. So, you know, if joining a that- guild like that, you may, you know, even though we are all living remotely at the moment, you know, you might be able to chat with uh, someone to potentially, you know, work on a project as an intern or mentor or, you know, possibilities are there. When- just, you know, put yourself out there, definitely. Yeah, Wednesdays are busy. I, I've missed all of those, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, Wednesdays are a busy day for me. But um, that is another great way is, you know, jo- everyone will know everyone on the call, but just say, hey, my name's Joe and I'm trying to get into the industry. And, you know, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I'm studying and become part of that that conversation. So when everything's lifted and we can all come back together again, they go, oh, yeah, you're that guy from the soundbar thing. Yeah, let's talk, um, you know. I would be, if I had the time, I'd be more than happy if someone sent me a session and said, would you have a look at this for me? You know, is is this okay? Um, Because people did that for me. Um, It took a lot to do it, but people did it for me and and I'd be more than happy to to do that, Um, you know, time permitting. But that is a great idea, Drew. So, yeah, if you can get involved in the Guild and do their Wednesday, Wednesday drinks... I think it's called the the sound bar meeting. Um, yeah, that would be bar. a great great way of meeting people. All right, let's um 
let's try and do a couple of um, rapid fire ones and, okay. and try and answer as many people as we can. Um, this one, I think there's a great answer. Um, do you think there's a better country to, to, to work in? I think is the question um, in France and there, is there a lack of school and opportunity compared to us or other English speaking country? I actually think there's a new answer to this. Um, our friends uh, in, in the streaming and OTT production world, there's more local productions happening in other languages than, than ever before. Ever before. Um, one, one of the standout hits on, on Netflix was dark, which was a German uh, production to start off with. So, I would definitely look at those opportunities. And I, I think we need more diverse talent from everywhere in the world. I don't think that it needs to be concentrated in one area. Of course, there's always going to be some amazing facilities in certain places, but I think we need great people interested in sound everywhere. So I would I would look into the opportunities locally first and try and Absolutely. help build the industry where you are. Yeah. But look at what Peter Jackson did in New yeah. Zealand. Like, I mean, that is... You know, that's an outstanding. The people who work there are incredible, hedgy, and and all those. It's an incredible facility. Um, and that was because Peter wanted to build the industry where he lived. You know, he yes, he went to Hollywood to get the rights and the approval to do it, but he brought everything back home. And and you know, it's it's an amazing facility. So, I would explore the opportunities available to you. And Daniel's spot on. You know hits are coming from every direction um you know through the streaming platforms um so there's no one real country that i would i would recommend over the other um and especially in the environment we're in now is try and carve out a niche for yourself with those opportunities that are that are in the country that that you're in um one from our um uh, good friend mr hagerman um andy hey is he oh dear um so obviously you're trained and certified but i believe you're also um have uh, gotten to instructor level and he's curious to hear I know um, what he's uh, gonna say I uh, how, the instructor exam <laughs> um but what he, that's brought to your professional career i'm sure it's helped in communication and explaining ideas but it's an interesting point it has it, it really has and i I say that I failed the instructor thing because Andy and I have a tacit agreement that he can bring it up in any language, in any workplace, because I ticked the wrong box on the instructor exam. My fault. And it's used as a sense of humor for everyone involved except for me. Um, no, the instructor course, getting to that point, it's taught me better ways to communicate and not just be a teacher, but try and be an educator. And that's, you know, again, you know, Andy, Mike Baber, Chris McKeith, they're not teachers and they're not instructors, they're educators. And there's a big difference. For, this is, again, my own opinion, is you need to be able to take the information that you have and be able to communicate it to someone in a way that they'll understand and they'll retain. And that is the real difference between a teacher or instructor and an educator and that's what I try to be I'm not the best at it because I still things that are easy to my brain because I mix is sometimes hard for me to communicate but it's something I'm working on and it's you know I've, I've built a team here of, of four, sort of four solid operators that I've sort of taught from the ground up in what we do and each of them are very different personalities and and they have different interests and they have different focus and they have different ways of learning. So I try and deliver that information customized to them. And I think that's the real, real big difference. But that's, that's what the trainer trainer um, taught me um, and, and really helped me with. And, and Andy helped me, me through that instead of just sort of running everything by the book, you know, page one to page 500 is taking that information and crafting it to the particular person you're trying to communicate it to. And that's really important for not only comprehension, but also retention. Yep. Um, probably takes a little bit of time to get into, but I think we can answer it pretty quickly for Mike. Um, how's Dante help with your workflows? Um, certainly, um, you know, we've implemented Dante into a number of our um, devices at Avid, and it's a great 
uh, connectivity tool that's um, network uh, compliant. And uh, as we get into larger stems um, going between rooms, even uh, Dante equipped amplifiers and things like that, it just opens up a, a world of opportunities and certainly makes cabling a, a lot more simple. Mm -hmm. Ab absolutely. It's something that we haven't implemented yet. Um, what we were going to do was do a test bed with a voiceover booth and our edit suites, and that was going to be our sort of proof of concept. Um, but again, COVID slowed that down, um, and we're looking to do that in December of this year. But the op uh, in my own study and own research, Dante really does open up a world of opportunity. Um, I know, you know, the guys up at Folklore have, have implemented it pretty heavily in Queensland, um, but we're yet to do it here just because... Uh, it was one of the things we'd planned to do, but didn't get around to it. But but I think Dante's incredible, and the fact that Avid have implement have already implemented it um, means it's going to be a format and a standard um, that's that's here to stay. It really is a bit of a game changer. You know, where you used to have, you know, huge multi cores going between rooms, you can now run that on you know a Cat six cable and and be able to lock that network down and that's incredible and it, it does open up some some amazing opportunities not only for people working individually at home but also in you know facilities and also multiple facilities across cities it's it's a really amazing format and transport format yeah um there's a there's a couple of um uh, there's a couple of longer ones about obviously we're talking to students but there's also people who are more experienced in the industry um and or are a little bit further on in their career and mm -hmm. how they would deal with uh, local competition for work um and um you know is it worth making investments and things like that i guess what i would say is um f for me um you know it's my passion anyway so mm -hmm. Actually, it's a it's a pretty low barrier to entry to really start doing some work. Of course, if you get to a lot, if you're producing deliverables for television or anything like that, you do need to be in a certain environment. But there is a, a level of work you can do with a, a very uh, simple system. I, I don't think that the the barrier to entry is particularly high anymore. And as far as competition with other people, I've actually found it quite uh, advantageous to work with people. Um, people will get busy, collaborate with them, help them, advise them, um, because, you know, you may get too busy. You actually need someone that you can trust and work with um, on your side. So, um, you know, for me, I, outside of Avid, I, I genuinely maintain my completely own personal Pro Tool system because I do use that um, yeah. in, in my professional career. And um, it is not that it's not that big a hurdle to to maintain that of course i have some access to some other great equipment being at avid but um... yeah ab absolutely i i do exactly the same thing is i've got my my work set up and i've got my home set up that i pay for and maintain and and that's that's all mine um and the, you're right the the barrier to entry now is is so much you know more affordable and, and easier to do and a, a great quote from someone I used to work with here, Sam Haywood, awesome mixer. He mixed, uh, Drew helped him onto the S6 platform. Um, Sam's the best. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it, Drew spent some time with him. Sam's got a thing of, if you can't mix it with Pro Tools and the standard plugins, you can't mix. And so, and he's proved it. Like he's just used all the stand, you know, you've got the Pro Tools license and the plugins that come with Pro Tools. And he sort of said, you know, if you can't, can't mix it with that you shouldn't shouldn't be mixing so you don't need to go out and spend thousands on you know altiverb and all those sort of you know formula one super high-end plugins you can do so much with what you're given in the standard you know sort of subscription pack um with pro tools um again competition because deluxe and i've got my deluxe hat on at the moment because we're not sort of competing in the local market for work i don't really have a comment on that because we're sort of outside of that because of you know we are a division of our los angeles office and we do that work with them um but domestically the more people you can work with um you know go out there and collaborate with people that's that's my best advice and i know it's easy to say than do but you know 
email people, you know, find out who's doing what and where they're doing things and see if you can become involved in that um, and maintain that sort of Pro Tools subscription. Even if it's just the, the standard one, you'll be able to do work and collaborate. And, you know, now with cloud collaboration, it doesn't matter whether you're in the same city or the same country, you know, you can still collaborate with people through cloud collaboration and all that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. There was actually an interesting question about um, working across um, different countries. Um, my, uh, you know, uh, being a New Zealander living in Japan, um, it has been interesting. There are different cultural differences in this case. It's um, and uh, and being in Australia, talking about working with um, uh, Bollywood uh, in this mm -hmm. case. So whether the notes are different, and and yeah, there there probably are going to be some differences. But I think right now the situation that we're in this COVID situation has really shown us that with some security um things taken care of where you are matters a lot less than it used to Absolutely. Um, yeah there's always going to be cultural considerations but i i don't think that anyone should think that they are really limited by where they are i don't really like that idea i mean you know uh, coming from new zealand as well and yeah. as you say they built up a, a fantastic industry there and there's amazing stuff that comes out of australia southeast asia japan korea i mean look at the k-pop industry it's absolutely yeah. exploded like yeah make make it happen i guess is is the thing i, I probably the theme we've been on throughout is that there's a really an opportunity to make what you want the the ways to get out to people now are almost unlimited whether that's youtube whether it's through even um, not not to plug avid necessarily but yeah. um avid play you can yep. now release music independently um just by yourself it gets out to the world if you put in the right comments someone's going to find your music um it's i think it's easier than ever and, and this idea of i'm in the wrong place uh, it doesn't necessarily count as much as it used to. No, it doesn't. You, you, you're absolutely right. You know, I really do think that for all the bad COVID has, you know, brought on the world, it has opened up these other opportunities where it used to be absolutely not. We are not sending, you know, content. We're not doing that. With the correct security protocols in place, it has really sort of knock down those barriers and we have a an audio division in bangalore um and the best thing to break down those cultural barriers is exactly what we're doing now is if you email someone um depending what their level of english um comprehension is things can be misconstrued there might not be the same technical things but if you're sitting talking to someone on a video call all that goes away and you're able to describe it, you're able to explain it. Although the guys in Bangalore speak great English, there are always going to be those things where you know, ah, a recent one was coalesce trim automation. Yeah. Right? That, that's, a, that's a sort of high concept in Pro Tools. Um, you know, you sort of sat down and went, okay, I'm going to share my screen, I'm going to show you and we're going to talk through it and problem solved, move on. And it's really broken down those barriers. And so I don't think there is... Um, you know, that, that barrier anymore. And at the, the NAB show uh, last year, there was a really great um, diagram put up by um, the guys at Smart Post Sound where they had a dialogue editor in Atlanta, an effects editor in Seattle, and it all sort of culminated down at Smart Post in Burbank. And all of that was being done through the Avid Cloud. So that person was, you know, editing the effects in, in Seattle the dialogue in Atlanta, and it was all sort of culminating, you know, back down in, in Burbank. And that that's the kind of thing that can be done now. You know, anyone can collaborate with anyone. You just need to reach out and make those opportunities happen. They're not going to come to you. You know, we're all locked in our houses or we're all locked in travel bubbles. Um, you know, reach out and try and make those opportunities happen. Um, and if, if one person's not responsive, don't let it you know, sort of hold you back, try the next person. Yeah. Okay, just to knock off a, a few more as quickly as we can. I got a question mm -hmm. about um, streaming equipment and method methodologies. This is really interesting. We've all had to get quite good at this. Um, you know, we've done what live webinars um, with Avid, um, you know, uh, 
obviously being in Australia, there's sometimes some internet concerns. Um, my advice, uh, Lachlan, there is um, check out YouTube. There's a lot of great people talking about their setups, exactly what gear they've bought um, to try and do sort of live to air streaming of, of, of music events. Certainly within the Pro Tools professional realm, um, there's some really great um, plugins out there like Audio Movers, the stuff that um, Source Connect, those Source those. Connect. Um, those sort of sort of tools absolutely exist for the professional environment. But if you're talking about going out to the public, um, there is there's some pretty good advice out there about uh, how to to do that. Um, probably the limiting factor, often more than the than the gear. To be honest, is um, is really just the internet connectivity. Um, you know, an assortment of microphones and a mixer is is pretty cheap these days. It's it's the um, getting getting it out there but there's lots of great advice um available online uh for those kind of issues, yeah. situations I, I would also suggest um anyone that's looking at doing live streaming have if you've got any friends that are obviously into video gaming you know have a chat to them because everyone's doing uh streaming on twitch or other platforms i know people are using um obs as a way of you know streaming uh to uh, platforms so if you've got any gamer friends that are doing any live streaming chat to them and find out what they're doing because some of their setups are actually really good yeah and some of them are streaming in 4k like yeah. i mean you know some people to get tv like you know streaming on netflix in 4k and i'm certainly not an expert it took a lot um thank you michael robinson for your assistance with that um in getting us set up to to do this today um but the, the one great thing is, is that the, the barrier that we hit was um, the amount of equipment for streaming and for webcasting and for, you know, sort of video blogging, you know, is blown up. We, we struggled to purchase the equipment yeah. to do this job because so many people, well, not this job, but, you know, this meeting, um, because so many people um, are buying that stuff for home. They're working from home. They want to be able to stream things to clients from home. Um, you know, that, that kit is, is being bought up very quickly. So, you know, it's, it's good for the industry. It's good for, you know, the manufacturers and, and also the more content, the better. Absolutely. Two questions here quickly that somewhat relate to each other um, mm -hmm. about uh, ADR um, and that a lot of people in this situation have had to um, do this at home, figure out mm -hmm. how to do that at home. And then someone, and I haven't seen uh, Mulan yet, uh, sorry mm -hmm. to say, but that, that some of the ADR they didn't think was uh, quite as good as it could be. Is it possible that changes in COVID affected this? It is very possible. Absolutely. It could just be time schedule. Um, there's a lot of people working very hard um uh, at our ott uh, uh friends to to mm -hmm. try and do this as quickly easily and as good as possible um it, it is an issue and i i don't know if you more to add there glenn but yep. yeah um is, and so what the other part of the question was is there people mixing at home yeah of, of course there Absolutely. is um uh, some of our, our our good friends um you know uh, i i do prep work before i go mm -hmm. to the studio glenn's doing it um, I know that, um, like Jonathan Wales, for example, had took his took part as S six, took it home, yep. put in a small Atmos rig. Yes, absolutely. People are mixing at home in this situation with near field mixing. It's much more achievable when you get mm -hmm. to theater releases. There is some restrictions around room size and SPL. But yes, there's a lot of stuff happening at home. Um, over to you, Glenn. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Um, the the one bit of advice I have for mixing from home is make sure that you have your speakers calibrated. Um, you know, there's... Oh, Drew, you're going to have to help me. What's the company that makes the plugin that does the EQ curve? Uh, there'd be Sonarworks. Well done, thank you. That's why you're the guy. Um, yes, Sonarworks. Um, I recently... Oh, actually, recently. It was December last year, I worked on a project that was using Sonarworks, and I mixed part of that from home, and then I mixed the final at work and they used the um, Sonarworks plugin to ensure linearity between the multiple locations it was being done. Um, so yes, make sure that you have your room calibrated properly, or not your room, sorry, your speakers calibrated properly to the correct SPL and make sure you're able to turn it up and down, whether that's a, you know, a audio interface or what, however you do it, or a speaker controller, however you do it. Um, and also, you know, pre-dubbing from home is going to be a thing in the future um, and it's something that Deluxe is looking at in, in offering stage one is having 
a print mastering service where people bring in their pre dub stems from home or another facility or a near field facility and then do a week here in finaling their theatrical mix. But for near field mixing, as long as you've got good speakers and they're calibrated, you know, properly and you know, absolutely you can mix from home. Now I can't speak to Mulan because I haven't seen it yet, but absolutely with the production schedule that they had and when it was finished, I most probably believe that COVID had a great impact on the quality or the fit of the ADR. Um, ADR is a dark art. Um, you need to be able to help the actor or the actress match the scene. Then you have the technicality of matching the microphone, whether it was lapel, whether it was boom. Um, RX have brought out a program that tries to help you with that. Um, and it has mixed success, um, but also Deluxe, without, you know, sort of tying the company line, we have a new product called OneDub, where you're able to, plat, you know, on our, you know, streaming platform, you're able to do a two time code and also two script sync um, ADR, as long as you have the correct microphone at the other end and that sort of thing. So the talent can log in do the ADR and then the engineer can export that out at the other end and that's something that we'll be launching in Australia later on this year which will mean that people will be able to do ADR in, in different environments but um, it's always difficult um, it's it's a it's a hard thing for the talent to be able to come back in six months later they've been working on another job put that character back on and then deliver that line the same way they did on the day. Um, you know, it's both a technical and also a creative challenge. So, um, yes, but when, when Mulan is, is streaming, I will definitely check it out. But it doesn't surprise me. Cool. Um, then now there's a question about um, commercial music, online video rights and stuff like that. You know what? That sounds like a great one to bring up with someone like the ASSG, um, how you deal with those things. I, I don't know that it's really the right place for us to answer that necessarily. No. It, um, it's that's a that's a minefield it's, it's it's different in every country and youtube have algorithms and yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure yeah but I, I would go to an industry organization like that who can probably answer those kind of things um yep. more clearly and the last one from um ali um sorry if i haven't said your name wrong um because we answered all the questions we're going to get there um mm -hmm. what's the best way to organize and back up your growing collection of clips stems raw sessions and sound recording um i think one thing's changed a lot for me glenn and i don't mm -hmm. know if it's the same for you um we used to gosh going back to scuzzy drives and stacking up four gig drives and having to return on and off the scuzzy drives so we're talking old stuff we're, now we're everybody i apologize age. we're dating yeah. ourselves um, now daniel sorry about that but <laughs> i mean we had to be very very careful about what we kept we never kept the video files um, we had to keep them in as small a proxy as we could, be, uh, a, a not full version of the video, um, because we just simply didn't have the space. There wasn't the networking technology that we, we have now. Now, certainly for me, obviously on some of the bigger jobs you work on, Glenn, um, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily going to be, be able to do this. But for my um, sound design and, and post-production work for commercials, I keep everything. I keep everything because I don't know when I'm going to go back. That includes all the AAFs, all the picture versions, because one thing, hard drives are cheap and, and that comes up to a thing. All mm -hmm. my stuff that I do professionally is backed up in three places. Um, two, 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 phys two physical and one off site, um, whether that's a secure online service or something like that. And I think mm -hmm. that's part of being a, a professional um, as well as a, a, an active system backup of my of my operating system in case my computer dries i can just plug in another one so certainly yeah, I, I keep i keep nearly everything now um i put an aaf folder inside my proto session folder i put mm -hmm. an extra folder for notes scripts and and that proto session is basically what owns or all of my bits live inside uh, again glenn you may have a working on larger projects there may be a different approach yeah no we have so for my own projects i do exactly the same thing that you do if it doesn't exist in three places it doesn't exist you know triplicate was a thing for a reason and if people don't know what triplicate is it's like that carbon paper you see with the yellow the white copy the yellow copy and the pink copy and when you write on it one goes one way one goes the other and the other goes the other and that's what triplicate is if it doesn't exist in three places it doesn't exist um 
every project that comes through um, Stage 1 or Deluxe Australia, depending which uh, client it's for, they have different requirements for their backup. But just for my peace of mind, everything gets backed up in three different places. Um, one op one option you do have is if you are starting to outgrow hard drives and things like that is that in any city you can go to um, a good AV rental company and rent an LTO drive and back things up to LTO tape and that's a really safe way of doing things. Um, it's something I'm pretty passionate about. I read a paper about, oh god it's eight years ago now, called the digital black hole and there's this thing of hard drive you know spinning hard drives die um you know it might not happen tomorrow but it will happen eventually um there's you know things where people have backed things up you know kids photos and they've plugged in the drive five years later and it won't spin up or you hear the ticking of death they're gone unless you have a high-end data retrieval company that you can go to and you have pretty much an unlimited budget you've lost those things um you know there are different nas configurations so I always approach things the same way, so at home, the same way I do at work, is you have near line, mid line, and archive. So near line is what you are working on today, tomorrow, and the next day. Mid line is something you worked on three months ago and the client might come back. And archive is something that has been completed past QC, has been platformed or has gone out to cinemas or has gone on to TV or radio, and then that's a long-term archive. Yes, hard drives are getting much cheaper. Um, NAS storage is a great way of doing um, that kind of backing up. But if you have sort of outgrown those sort of hard drives, the bigger the hard drive you get, you need to buy three of them. So that cost starts to sort of extrapolate out. Um, so the way I've dealt with that is every 12 months, I rent an LT07 drive and I buy a couple of tapes and I back up all that archive stuff to three LTO tapes, mark them. I currently don't have my stuff um, at a third place because um, I've sort of hit the limit of storage space at my mum's house, so she won't <laughs> allow anything more to go in. But um, I need to find another solution for that, whether it's a cloud-based solution or something like that. But data storage and data protection is is something everyone should take really really seriously um and you know having an active backup you know apple have made it so easy the time machine thing anybody can use and what it means is is that if your computer dies you know on monday on tuesday morning you can rent one or borrow one or you know if you have the budget buy a new one plug it in and your computer is as it was yesterday um they've never made it easier to do that um but archiving is I always treat it in those three different ways and then have three copies of that yeah absolutely so in in yeah I, there was the the backup part and also the the, the stems clips and, and so on so yeah I generally I mean yeah. it's only for 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 me it, I, I try and make it as readable for anyone so that I wouldn't have to spend days explaining it to anyone else yeah. whether that's track comments markers or even a little document to explain what everything is um mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt like uh, I don't know necessarily who I'm going to have to pass a project on to yeah and and with stems is I always so those stems and that print master is a deliverable. So I separate mine as the work Pro Tools sessions and yeah. the deliverable Pro Tools sessions, and they go on two separate drives. And those deliverable Pro Tools sessions will contain the dialogue stem, music stem, print master, um, surround, you know, yeah, your multitude of surround mixes plus your LTRT or your stereo crash down or whatever has been requested. And then that goes along with the final video version, including, you know, sort of. And, and then it, it gets separated off like that. So, yes, there are two separate backups of that, the work and, you know, mix sessions and then the final deliverable sessions. Okay. I well, also wanted to chime I'm in sorry, and say um, uh, if you go to, obviously, um, up the first place I navigated to for, you know, file structuring and naming was the um, Grammy uh, producer and engineers uh, website and there's a whole oh, lot of did... recommendations for folder defini definitions and hierarchy and naming and also did maybe you have a look at Netflix. Hey, did I misinterpret Ali's question? 
No, no, no. You nailed it. I was just adding my two cents. Oh, right. No, no. That 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 Grammy document I got. Yeah, years ago, and it's fantastic. It's really it's really good, and you can, you can repurpose it to to post, you know, or to to whatever you're doing. It's really yeah, good good point, Drew. Yeah. So yeah, that's just the yeah Grammy producers and engineers wing technical guidelines. Um, even you know Netflix guidelines, they have information about deliverables and naming things as well a certain way, don't they? So I think yeah, it's just Netflix. good practice for good practice for everyone to look yep. at those. And, and the great thing about those Netflix specs is they're not locked behind a vendor wall or anything else. Anybody yep. can access them. And I guess we should probably do a wrap up of documents and links and things. And I'll, yes. I'll chase those up. The, everything that we've mentioned that we didn't have reference to, I'll um I'll dig all of those up so that Shana can sort of pack those together with this um, for anyone who's interested. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you can find that document, Drew, because I don't have it on hand, but um, yeah, the Netflix one is, is very good in describing what they want, how they want it, and how they want the naming convention done for those archivables, the deliverables, and also the work sessions. Awesome. Well, we did get through all the questions. We've gone quite a long time, and I think think that hopefully we've answered everyone's question hope everyone's really enjoyed it and i want to thank glenn again so so much for his time um for going out You're the best it, glenn um, thanks Drew. make make making uh the the network accessible all of those things that um he had to do to make this possible so i hope everyone really enjoyed that um we'll be looking forward to doing more of these kind of um these sessions, um, reaching out to the community. We're really passionate about education. So be looking out for those. Um, I think there was one more thing to pop up at the end uh, there, Drew. Yeah, there's the PowerPoint slide. You should have that up there. I'm, there we go. Ah, oh, there we go. The, just while we're waiting for that slide, um, you know, in I, I can only speak for Sydney um, at the moment, but, but there are so many ways to access um, AVID's certification and training. Um, you know, the guys at Digistore, the guys at Amber Tech, um, you know, AFTERS and all the other education providers is just sort of send them an email, look them up and ask, hey, ask, hey when, when's the next one coming up? Because they, they do come up and if you're not on their mailing list or if, you know, they're sort of not on your, um, on your radar, it's definitely well worth looking them up because they're all, you know, if they've been certified as a, an ALP, an AVID learning partner, um, you know, you know, you're going to get the right sort of instruction and tuition and, and the right course from them. And, and also all the other EDU providers throughout Australia. Um, you know, if one's not wanting run, running one this month, the other one might be. So, so definitely get in touch with those guys and the guys up at Amber and, and Digistore and everything like that are great. They're really, really a good value. And when Andy's allowed to travel again, make sure some, you know, you get on, if you haven't had a, if you haven't had the Hageman experience, you haven't had the, <laughs> you haven't, you haven't done it. He runs an excellent class. He He's great in a classroom. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah couldn't, yeah. couldn't An edutainer. An edutainer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He'd love that. <laughs> um, love you, Andy. So, yeah, the um, so the Australian uh, Screen Sound Guild, um, as mentioned, sounds like a great way to get in touch. Unfortunately, I've never been able to get down to one of the events. Let's hope that all changes. Um, yes. AVID certification, there's a link there to uh, getting more information about the AVID cert certification process and where you might be able to go and do that. And then also uh, Shauna, who uh, helped. Uh, put this event together and helping with education in the ANZ region. Uh, if you've got any ideas about what you would like to see, talk about uh, and do in the future, we've got a few ideas we're putting together, um, maybe a few challenges for students some things like that, that we'd like to see, um, let us know. Um, and we would love to talk to you all more because we're all people that are passionate about sound education and, and making sure everyone has a, a great experience being creative. Yeah. And AVID's never been more accessible. Um, you know, uh, Drew, and, Drew and, and Daniel and I spoke about this the other day was that, you know, now through, I'm, I'm not a big social media person, but now through the, the AVID socials and also the links that you've got on your screen, you can really reach out directly to someone at AVID and say, hey, th this is what I want to achieve. What's the, the best way to do it? And, you know, when will it be happening and, and how, you know, how should I do it? Um, you know, that's something that Avid have really improved upon from my point of view, um, especially with certification and especially with training um, and the education delivery and the way it's been 
written and uh, put together, it's it's never been better. So, um, you know, it's a great time to start, you know, sort of learning. And with the way COVID's going, if you've got a bit of extra time on your hands, you know, put it into your education, invest in you. That's my best advice. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have any closing words there, Shauna. Yeah, uh, no, uh, thank you uh, so much, Glenn uh, and Daniel uh, and Drew for, uh, for such a great webinar. And yeah, please feel free to, to look into ASSG and ASE. Um, they're awesome and, and they're great people. So um, feel free to ask them some questions and stuff like that and, and look into that because um, yeah, basically as Glenn says, just do as much as you can while you're, while you're doing your degree or even if you are post degree and you're in between jobs or whatever, if you have some spare time, yeah, please do upskill and, and learn as much as you can because it just makes you better. Um, but yeah, feel free to please reach me on that email if you guys, if you're an institution that have, you know, particular ideas or something that's more related to your course and you'd like us to put on a webinar, we can utilize, you know, some people in the industry that we know like Glenn um, to get on and, uh, you know, speak to your students. And if you're a student that wants to hear more about a particular area, um, please do the same. It's these events again, yeah. Like it says there, these events are for you. So we want to make sure that the content is relevant and interesting. So yeah, yeah. thank you both. Um, and thanks for everyone who attended like three hours, two and a half <laughs> hours out of your days is a, a big investment. So thanks for listening to Dan and I we, waffle on. We, we, we could go on, we could probably go on for days and days and days, but um, <laughs> we should probably put a pin in it there for today. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for organizing, Shauna. Dan, as always, Drew, thank you. Um, Thanks, Thanks for everyone's mate. time. And um, yeah, let's get through this COVID thing. It's it's terrible. Yep. Stay strong, stay safe. And if you need help, reach out for it. Absolutely. Bye. Hey, everyone. <laughs>